So I'm Bach Moore. I'm also an audio holic. Um, I love film and televisions uh, uh, shows, and this is basically about uh, soundtrack. Um, equalization curve I've been working on for years. I started out when I was like in the mid 80s uh, going to film school for animation and working on films and stuff and then eventually I got into a band and when you're in a band and a guitar player very often you turn out to be a sound guy so I became sound guy, revisited my film so basically I've been focusing for the last uh, since 1998 on basically coming up with an EQ preset which I personally used at over 4,000 live events and about 200 film and video soundtracks so far, helping people with their soundtracks. Okay, so I'm um, focusing on the anchor element. I borrowed this from working on like live shows, like I say. Uh, it was around 1998 when I first, I was doing sound for a couple of years there professionally, and then in 1998, um, somebody had said something into a microphone and I saw like 15 heads turn like this. So it's a singer. I didn't have a compression. I had EQ, but I was still learning how to use the graphic EQ at live shows. And then I saw all these heads turn, and I'm like, what was that? So I had my little CD player. I didn't have an RTA or anything. And I, I had my 31 tones on the CD, and I go, what was that? What was that? What was that? Oh, it was between like uh, 250 and 500 hertz. And then I started listening for that. Every single time I heard the same thing. It was a trend. And I'm like, well, what's going on here? So I started dipping that out a bit. And I found I didn't actually have to use a, comp a compressor when I did that and it smoothed out the vocals. So a couple of years later, anyways, just as a little background from all the, the recording devices I've used over the years. And um, <clears throat> so I found this, I was trying to, when I was working with a Fost X18, X18 and then the, the TIAC 144, there's a little booklet that said, how, how to fish out the vocals. I'm like, oh, I'm interested in this. This is going back way back in the 80s, right? So 10 years prior to when I actually noticed this thing. So it became an obsession of mine to fish out the vocals, not just turn them up, because some people go, well, the vocals aren't loud enough. It's like they're loud enough, but they're not cutting through. Or the low mids are too loud. There's something else going on here. So basically, and I've been working on, uh, with a Vegas Pro doing soundtrack stuff since 2003. So I worked on a, a documentary that got sold to a few TV stations. And I started going, what if I took that live curve and put it on a soundtrack and see what happened? And then I got these results that I really liked. And so this EQ curve, those are for live events. And I, have, I take pictures of all my graphs. I've been doing that since mid-90s. So every time I do it, I take a picture and then... You know, you look back at them and you go, there's similarities in here. Why, why is this, right? So, you know, this is live. So I took out 1.25 and 1.6 and there's different feedback happening. High pass filter and, uh, but the low mid dip seemed to be the key to having dialogue that cuts through a live show or a soundtrack. And it actually worked in both. So I modified it for a soundtrack, including uh, like a flat microphone, a good flat condenser microphone. And if the good flat condenser microphone um, was you know flat up top I would I sometimes would boost it around 7k as a center frequency like a half an octave and it helped with that low mid scoop which is only minus five or minus six at the at the most uh, at the bottom of that curve and it helped cut through more without actually um, you know it sounded louder but it wasn't actually louder so I'm using I've been using the AT815 for years for sound checks because I've done a lot of boom work too um, so I don't need to do the, the upper mid boost on that. It's already got one for, for the most part. But it definitely, most microphones I use are going to be fairly flat between 1 and 500. So this dip actually makes sense. Then I modified it to have a, a, a A curve and a B curve preset depending on the type of microphone. So for the most part, I use the A version of the curve. And then uh, sometimes I need to, like if there's music on the soundtrack, uh, ambient effects or any other kind of sound effects, and they're kind of drowning out the vocals a bit, the little 7K spike with a half octave and plus 3 dB boost actually helps it cut through just a little bit more. So I'm not doing anything super, super drastic with this. But the whole that was the whole start of the whole thing. Then I, I started realizing that, oh, and there's mild compression, just very mild compression. So if it's like low to high, I'm dealing with maybe 75% threshold, whatever that happens to be. So I'm really just taking the edge off the vocals. <clears throat> and that I found when you do that, uh, here's some actual measurements with the LKFS, which is a standard for TV. So if you're mixing for TV, you've got the minus 24 dB, plus or minus one or two. And in Europe, it's minus 23, plus or minus one goal to achieve for dialogue for the anchor element. But I find it a useful tool for film soundtracks, which seems to be kind of the Wild West, where you're sitting in a movie, like I just watched John Wick 2, and I, I take my SPL meter. I, I can't really go to the theater with people. I annoy people. Because I sit there with my SPL meter, and I take notes. 
And then I, I go get the DVD if I really like the movie, or even if it's a bad movie, I'll go buy it just to compare. And then I'll bring it on and I'll do a, a, a transfer to my timeline and I'll compare. And the results are the same thing every time. So I'm sitting in the movie and you're getting blown away by loud stuff, but you can't hear the quiet dialogue and it's a little bit annoying. So I, my goal is to help independent filmmakers because I don't think I can teach old dogs new tricks. So I'm focusing on a lot of us students that are working on films right now. But these measurements, this is a raw dialogue and it's a Hollywood sample that you can get online. It comes in at minus 23.4. I put the D-curve B version on, decibel and a half drop. I do some compression. Another decibel and a half drop, 3 dB in total. Then I do gain makeup, um, and we end up at the back at the original. But now I don't, we don't have the audio set up, and I would definitely send you links to hear the difference because I got a lot of YouTube videos with this on it. But there is a difference. The dialogue now sounds more present and cuts through. In fact, you could probably turn it down a bit, and it would, you would still actually hear it because it cuts through. So this just helps a little more, and especially it helps with... Um, when you add music and sound effects to it. So this is where I ended up at just uh, about one year ago, helping this film reel for an indie film fest. And their, their levels were all over the place, right? They did a sound test a couple of nights before to make sure, so we, they go down to the theater. And you've got this, I don't know if you see that, but that is how somebody decides to mix like a trailer, because they had a couple of trailers before the, the reel played. And it had to be on one digital cinema package, of course. You can't, you know, and nobody in a, a cinema is gonna sit there and mix your film for you. So everything has to flow nicely without people going, what, I couldn't hear a word they said, and then being blown out the back of the theater. So the whole goal was to smooth it all out so people could have an enjoyable experience, right? And not be annoyed, right? So um, this, is the troubled reel. It's a music sample comparison, and the blue line is my volume automation or my uh, volume envelope edit tool. You get this, you know, symphonic music happening, and then it goes bang, like the modern style of, you know, jarring people is that big horn, you know, orchestra sound, which is annoying, but it can be effective. It was just way too loud, so the cinema operator was like, I don't want to ruin my speaker. So they turned the master level down, which was already tuned to the magic number of seven on his processor, turns it down to like four and a half or five, and that's quite a bit. Now, the quiet dialogue on the other films are, is going with it. Now, the dialogue is into the popcorn noise, and people could not hear, so we had to... Basically, what I did was uh, remix this whole thing. Yeah, so that's volume automation going all the way through, just clicking parts and going through the whole reel and redoing the print master so that when they played it, people would go, I like those movies, as opposed to, what the hell is the matter with the sound? <laughs> so um, this is the map I came up with, and I made a few rough versions of it and constantly <laughs> modifying it without putting too, too much on it. But basically, especially for people getting into it, uh, I, I talked to people who went to Ryerson for four years. And they said, we didn't really talk about audio that much. I'm like, okay. after four okay. years? And the, their thesis was a film after four years. And this is more than one person. I was kind of shocked. Going, okay, so I met one guy at the beer store. He said, you're on YouTube, eh? Can you help me out? So I helped him out with the soundtrack. And so I eventually I started developing maps for, okay, because it's a mystery to people. If they can't see anything, they hear waveforms coming through speakers. Visuals, you can tell if red, green, blue is off, but with audio, it's like a lot of people are like, it's a mystery because they can't see it. So I decided, okay, I'll come up with a map and help people with the map. So this is map A, which is just some basic guidelines of measuring calibrated speakers. So if you're gonna do cinema style in a decent sized room, you're gonna calibrate your speakers to 85 dBC weighted, of course. Um, and then your dialogue is actually going to measure around conversational level, no surprise. Even in IMAX, no matter what cinema I'm in, I'm like, there you go, 58 to 65 dB, you know, textbook pretty much. So the mixers for big films definitely know what they're doing. Um, but I recommend if you equalize it a certain way, you can actually get the dialogue to sit around between minus 27 and minus 30. I measured the Dark Knight. Dark Knight was, it came in around 56 dB for quiet dialogue scenes. Uh, up to maybe 62 or something like that. When I actually measured uh, LKFS, we're like minus 38 sometimes, minus 36. I'm thinking, that's a little quiet. You know, when, when I bought the DVD and I'm watching it at home, I'm turning the volume down and then turning it back up. Anyone do that? It's just, 
It's annoying, right? So when they do the print master for DVD, they can't, not everybody can always make one spe uh, specifically for DVD, but through the research I found, they actually did for The Dark Knight do a, print, a new print master for the DVDs and Blu-rays, but they admitted that we didn't do too much to it. We just kind of tweaked it here and there. So it's essentially the same. And when I measured it again at home, I'm like, there's the same levels pretty much within a couple of decibels. So John Wick 2, I recently measured that, sitting there going like that. My friends are like, oh God, I can't take him anywhere. <laughs> I gotta know, I have to know, right? Um, and dialogue was hotter. Dialogue was between 60 and 65 on average, except for a couple of quiet moments. It was generally louder. Gravity I measured, and that was up around 65, 68 dB. Of course, they had the, the headsets for the space helmets, so they're not going to have a lot of bandwidth there. So that kind of made sense. <clears throat> but in gravity, I heard every single word they said, right? But I couldn't say that for a lot of films. Um, so then there's soundtrack or jump scare sound map for when people want to make jump scares they go well we're gonna make it really quiet and then we're gonna pummel you with sound and they do that and you're just sitting there going whoa like stop it right so there's an effective way to get a jump scare which I found and I did experiments with students over the years I teach classes on this too and I did experiments we wrote it on the board and I said I'm gonna do jump scare A jump scare B C and we went through the whole list and I wanted to see who liked what everybody or I'd say about maybe 70 to 80 percent of the people liked jump scare so you get your quietness goes in you know you're going to scare the audience now so you got to go a little quieter and then boom right uh instead of just blasting and sustaining at that same level for too long this half a second dip to minus four db seemed to be really effective to get the jolt out of people and then you're not so you know annoyed listening to loudness because some people just like loud and they like to affect people but then again the experience can be off a little bit where people go, well, I think we're mixing movies too loud. Right, and I've read that discussion. Randy Tom and the Cinema Audio Society would say that. There's an article you can read on filmsound.org. Are we mixing movies too loud? It's like, well, we're not mixing too loud. We're just, the, the directors and producers want it too dynamic. And especially with digital playback systems and subwoofers, you're getting a lot of extra stuff in the room. So your 30 to 35 dB dynamic range electronically turns out to be what I've measured up to 50 dB in the room. That's a lot. Right? So these, these are just simple ways to go, okay, we can calm down the dynamic range but still get the effect from people. And they don't, you know, the problem with a lot of soundtracks is people go, what was up with that music? What was up with that sound? It's like, they shouldn't be doing that. They should be paying attention to the story, right? And so there, these are ways to help, especially now, a lot of independent filmmakers try to achieve that goal. And that's, oh yeah, so I just have conclusions here, but I just basically explained it. So that's all I got. That's great.